We're continuing our discussion about core principles in anatomy and physiology. We've talked about homeostasis and negative feedback. We know that we need to study processes that occur in the human body, and process implies movement or motion. So we need to understand how molecules move in the human body. Therefore, we're gonna move on to our discussion on flow down gradients. And this is gonna be a discussion about forces that move things in solution in the human body. Things move if we apply a force to them. That's a trusty copy of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy here, this book. If I put it down on the table, it doesn't move on its own. But if I push it, if I apply a force, it will move. And if I apply more force, it moves faster. I can apply a force in more than one direction. I can apply it from my right to left and my left to right. I can do that at the same time. If those forces are equal, but in opposite directions, then the object doesn't move. So movement will be in the direction of the highest force. If there's greater force from the right than the left, the book will move to the left. If there's greater force from the left to the right, the book will move toward the right. Now, another thing we have to keep in mind in terms of movement is there's resistance to movement. So if I apply a certain force to this book, it moves at a certain rate. If I change the friction of the table, it might move slower. So let me just grab my, okay. So with a little more friction on that surface, it moves slower with the same force. Notice that resistance did not change the direction of movement. Resistance opposes movement from a force, but it's different from a force push pushing in the opposite direction. We're going to talk about three different kinds of forces. Mechanical forces, concentration gradients, and electrical forces. Before we go further when we talk about mechanical forces, what we're really going to be talking about is pressure. And there's a difference between pressure and force. Let's take our book and say it weighs a pound. If I put that book on the table, then that pound of weight is spread out over the entire surface that it touches. If I put the book on top of a small um, canister of lip balm, that same weight has to be supported, but it's supported over a smaller surface area. So in this case, there's no pressure on the part of the table that's not touched by the canister of lip balm, but more pressure, more weight per square inch on this smaller area. So pressure is force normalized per surface area. The mechanical pressure that we're concerned with in the human body is generally called hydrostatic pressure. And we can think of hydrostatic pressure as the pressure exerted by a column of water. Since pressure is a measurement of force over surface area, the only thing that matters in each of these glasses is the height of the water. If the water is higher on one side than another, there will be more weight exerted per area on the bottom than on the other side, and it will tend to draw, drive water in that direction. So one of our checkpoints later in this uh, section is gonna be, how does a siphon work? We know that there's more pressure on the bottom of the glass on my right-hand side than the left, but no water is flowing through the tube. In these two glasses of water, the levels will quickly reach equilibrium where the hydrostatic pressure on one side of the system is equal to the hydrostatic pressure on the other side of the system. So gravity can generate hydrostatic pressure by working on water, but so does our heart. If liquids don't compress, so if we apply a force that could attempt to reduce the volume of a system, the only way this volume can be reduced is if liquid is removed. By applying force, we generate pressure. 
the pressure on the water pushes the water in all directions. It pushes it towards my finger. And there's a certain amount of force, pounds per square inch, acting on my finger. That same pressure is exerted on the walls of this tube, perpendicular to the system, or in the bowl, as long as I'm squeezing. Pressure everywhere within this system is the same if we measure it in pounds per square inch or millimeters of mercury. Now, fluid wants to go from high pressure to low pressure, from where there's higher force to lower force. It can only go that direction if the force is sufficient to overcome those forces resisting it to push it out the end of the tube. So we'll see hydrostatic pressure in our body as mechanical engines work to change volumes in given spaces. So hydrostatic pressure works equally on all the molecules in a solution. If we have a solution that has uh, glucose dissolved in water with sodium and chloride ions in it, all of those molecules are affected equally by hydrostatic pressure, which would tend to move those molecules out of the system in which they're contained. Let's contrast that with concentration gradients. So if we have a look at this red food coloring, when we drop the food coloring into the water, it's not equally dispersed. But over time, on its own, it will swirl around and twirl around until the concentration of red dye molecules is the same in every part of the glass. Once that distribution has been achieved, this doesn't go backwards. There's a force that will drive molecules from areas of greater concentration to lower concentration. Now keep in mind that red food coloring and blue food coloring are different molecules. So if we put both a drop of red food coloring and a drop of blue food coloring in this water, then the forces will act to disperse the blue dye molecules independent of the red dye molecules. If for some reason the red dye molecules can't get to one part of the glass, the blue molecules will still disperse if they can. And if the red molecules can't get to one part of the glass, then there will be some pressure that would drive those molecules to areas of lower concentration. So the term concentration gradient reach, refers to a difference in concentration between one area in the system and another. And the greater the difference in concentration, the greater the force that will drive molecules from one spot to another. Now the next type of force we want to talk about is an electrical force. If you've ever played with magnets, you know that positive charges are attracted to negative charges. I about broke my fingers with these rare earth magnets, but let's uh, just try to do this slowly. I've got, let's see, two different magnets I'm going to show you. They're going to be very attracted to each other. Put my finger in between there to kind of slow this down, and hopefully you can see they're attached. I can exert quite a bit of mechanical force to try to pry those apart, but these positive and negative charges really like each other. So positive charge wants to travel towards negative charge. If we separate more positives from negatives, then there's a greater force of attraction or a greater voltage. If those charges are allowed to flow in the direction they want, those forces will generate motion. The three different types of forces we've discussed are mechanical forces like hydrostatic pressure. Those forces work on all molecules in a solution equally. Concentration gradients, a concentration gradient will be specific to any given molecule. So the concentration gradient at work on sodium ions is different from the one at work on chloride ions. Those molecules want to be distributed equally, independent of each other. And there are also electrical forces that work on charged molecules or particles. So in that case, all positive charges are attracted to negative and vice versa, but an uncharged molecule like glucose would not be moved by an electric force. 